The day of reckoning is finally here. No justice, no peace for too many years. We're marching for equality in every state. Choosing love over violence, brutality, and hate. We're gonna stand up for what is right. We're gonna stand up red, black, brown, and white. We're gonna stand up trans, gay, and straight. Cause it's the right thing to do. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Payne. I am a founding board member of the advisory board of TomTom. Tom. And I would very much like to welcome each of you here today. On behalf of our board, I wanna thank you as well as our presenters for taking time to join us. And our event today is part of a seven week event series called Cities Rising Summit. Cities Rising will explore critical issues surfaced by COVID-19 and the movement for racial justice, especially as it relates to small and mid-sized cities. Uh, all Cities Rising events will be available on a pay what you can scale. And we thank all the support from all of our sponsors and members like you. If today's program resonates with you, please consider becoming a contributing member to the foundation. You can do so on our website, which is tomtomfoundation.org backslash give. The city's rising summit will run until October 30th. It's a seven week series. And we encourage you to get as involved as possible over the course of the coming weeks. You can also join us for weekly meet and greets and interactive change maker sessions. Connect on our Slack workplace and please email our team at any time with your questions and with your feedback. All talks throughout Cities Rising will be recorded. So if you enjoy today's session, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it with your colleagues and your friends. Please note the chat function in the bottom right corner of your screen. You can use that to connect with other participants on the call today or share your live experience around the issues we'll be talking about. Also, please note the Q&A function. You can use that to ask questions of our speakers. Our moderator will have eyes on that channel and will introduce your questions and insights into how they steer today's conversation. The title of today's talk is My Vanishing Country and features Bakari Sellers and Dr. Cameron Webb, two luminaries who have been active in helping shape the critical moment for the future of our communities. Today's event is part of a week of program centered around criminal justice, and is brought to you by Seville Weekly and Goodstock Consulting. And we thank them for their incredible support and their collaboration with TomTom. Tom. With that, I am pleased to introduce you to our moderator today, Dr. Cameron Webb, who is the Director of Health Policy and Equity at the University of Virginia and a candidate for the 5th District Congressional District. With that, I will turn the conversation over to Dr. Cameron Webb. And again, our great appreciation for joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for, uh, for kicking this off. Really excited about week two of the Cities Rising Summit. I think this is a, it's an exciting opportunity to bring folks together to have some of the critical conversations that, that we need to be having in our nation. So this is a, a really special moment. Now, I, I want to start off by, by saying a little bit about my own background, because I think that for me, you know, I grew up in, in Spotsylvania County, Virginia, not far from where I live now, uh, just outside of Charlottesville. And, and so I've seen a couple of different angles of, of the types of cities that we live in. But, but I think we have a really unique and incredible guest today, and I'm really honored to, to moderate because, because our guest, Bakari Sellers, and, and kind of the context for this conversation, 
He's speaking to a really important part of, of our nation, a part of the heartbeat of who America is. And he's speaking from his own personal perspective, the work that he's done, the life that he's lived so far. And it's really exciting to have him on here. You know, I'm the Director of Health Policy and Equity at the UVA School of Medicine. But in that role, so much of what I've seen is that health does not happen in hospitals or clinics. It happens in the places where uh, where we are born, grow, live, learn, eat, play, and pray. It happens everywhere that we live our lives. And that's something that, that Mr. Sellers knows a thing or two about. I want to start off just by introducing him briefly, because uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Mr. Bakari Sellers, uh, he is uh, a guy who, who grew up in Denmark, uh, South Carolina. Uh, and he'll talk a little bit about his experience there. He grew up uh, really in a celebrated family in a lot of ways, pretty notorious. I won't spoil any any of that from the book, but went off to college at Morehouse uh, College in Atlanta, Georgia. Before, uh, after he finished his college studies, he actually uh, decided to run for office and became the youngest African American elected uh, to state uh, to office as a state representative in South Carolina. And that was while he was starting law school, by the way. So he's a little bit of an overachiever there. Finished his legal studies. He's practicing. Served in the legislature for a while, and uh, and then after that, he he did run for lieutenant governor wasn't successful, but really moved the needle. And I think that he talks about that some really thoughtfully in his book. And now he's most well known these days as a regular CNN commentator. And he's been speaking uh, thoughtfully and, and forcefully on some of the most critical issues uh, facing our nation, particularly around race and, and the dynamics there. And, and so with that, I just want to welcome uh, Mr. Bakari Sellers uh, to this conversation. Thanks for joining us. And thank you so much, Dr. Webb. Thank you to Tom Tom. Thank you to Susan Payne, who, by the way, uh, now, since everyone is having a Zoom backdrop, I can tell you that uh, Susan gets a, a 10 out of 10 room raider uh, designation for how dope her kitchen looked and her setup looked. So shout out to Susan, uh, Ben Wilkes, for, for having us here. And I, I'm just, I'm so excited about you, brother. I'm excited to have this conversation. Been looking forward to this, spending some time with you. I wish the Rona would let us be great. Uh, so we could all be in person, um, but we'll have to make do. I, I have to apologize before we get started that you may hear some little voices running around the house, but that's just, uh, you know, what happens when uh, you're working from home. I'm the father of, of 20 month old twins uh, who are pretty disrespectful and they just climb in your space and they don't care what you're doing. So they, and they love the camera. I don't know where they get that from. Um, but You know, they, they may, they may join us at any point. So just the FYI. Awesome, awesome. Well, listen, I, I wanna I wanna jump in on the front end. It's interesting. So I, I'm gonna start off by by plugging it because you know I'm in the middle of a congressional campaign. Every single night I, I read. It's part of how I keep my, my focus and my sanity. And I spent the last couple of nights reading uh, your book, uh, My Vanishing Country. Um, and and man, I, no exaggeration, it is an incredible page turner. And I, I from when I started it, all the, I literally just read it read it straight through. It was kind of, I usually read a couple books at a time, but it was the only one I was reading because it was really, really thoughtful. And I think you really bring folks in on the front end. And what was so incredible to me is that we grew up in very different places. I'm from, from Virginia. You know, I went to, as we call it, a PWI, University of Virginia. We have different professions, even though I'm a lawyer, I'm also a, a doctor. And, and I think our actual practice looks very different. But man, so much of what you were saying in that book yeah. resonates with me. Can you start off with just kind of how you grew up? You, you describe it in the book as, you call yourself country. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, yeah. So talk about that a little bit. What was it like growing up country in, in, uh, in Denmark, South Carolina? So that's a good question. And, and, and again, thank you for having me. And thank you for having this, this amazing discussion. Because, you know, a lot of times, it, and it comes from the media, it's an it's a inaccurate portrayal of who we are. And people will say urban to denote black, and they'll say rural to denote white. And what I wanted to do was throw that narrative on his head and say, wait a minute, there are a bunch of rural folk um, who um, are people of color, right? And they um, have contributed greatly um, to society. They have been a part of the soil. And when I say the soil, I'm, I'm from the black belt and it's not because of black people, but because of the richness of the soil where you were able to grow crops like soy and sugarcane and cotton, corn, et cetera. Um, and so it, it has been, this book was an amazing uh, journey and, and you, you with all these degrees can probably, uh, can probably tell me which word is right, but it's either therapeutic or cathartic or combination of both, right? Oh. <laughs> both, yeah, it was a thank you. I, I figured I was get that one right. It, it was a combination of both. Um, my, my first chapter, which was the introduction was my 
most well-written chapter because I was a, I, what I wanted people to do was be able to touch and taste and smell and feel what it meant to grow up in the poor rural South. My hometown has three stoplights and a blinking light, uh, Denmark, South Carolina. We're nine miles away from Norway. And in between Denmark and Norway, you have two small unincorporated towns called Finland and Sweden, right? So uh, we, we always had this great imagination. Uh, we grew up jumping ditches behind the Denmark Recreation Center. Uh, my father ran the, ran the recreation center. He ran the uh, a youth summer uh, football and basketball programs. Um, it was from a place where everybody knew each other. It was, it was, and I, I actually just uh, turned in the, uh, got my manuscript for my children's book accepted last, the last week or so, last couple of weeks. So, uh, and, the, and it focused on the themes that I brought up in my vanishing country, which are, you know, who are your people and, and where are you from? You know, those are the questions that are asked where we're from, like who, who are your people? And that means they want to know who you're related to or how we are related. And uh, we were separated by the tracks in terms of wealth. Um, not a whole lot of wealth, but what, you know, some of us had a little bit of something and some of us didn't have as much. And so it was just, it was home. It was, it was, um, I can think the best way to describe it is it was poor, but we didn't know what we didn't have. Um, and we, we had a great sense of family, um, and we maintained our sense of hope and sense of faith. And it was also deeply, as you, as you alluded to earlier, my life has been deeply entrenched in the civil rights movement. I look at myself as being a son of the movement and um, you know, those lessons that I learned from the deep South are, are a part of that as well. Yeah, you know, when we, it's interesting. So I met my wife at UVA and when I first met her, I remember her, she's from Appomattox County, Virginia. And I remember her saying, I'm from a town with one stoplight and one blinking light. So when you just said that, it reminded me of Leanne's experience growing up. And I always grew up thinking I was from a really rural county in Spotsylvania County. and and then I met Leanne and I went to Appomattox and I spent a lot of time there. And I said, there are, there are levels to this, as we say. Exactly. <laughs> there are levels. You got to understand now. I mean, we all, we all may be a little rural, but there's some parts, uh, as we say down south, that's behind God's back. <laughs> um, so there's some, there's some deep rural areas in this country. And you know, the crazy part about it is, man, um, to kind of give an overlay of a, of a political or, or policy perspective, um, you have just, as you talk about, I mean, as a candidate for office, you will definitely highlight that a lot of these areas have been forgotten. Um, we've turned our back on these areas. Um, these areas were devastated, as I talk about. Um, they were devastated by um, NAFTA and CAFTA, right, in the early 90s. Uh, they sent many of those textile mills and manufacturing companies away. The small businesses um, have now been boarded up. You go through a main street, you can tell the lifeblood of these small rural communities by main street and where we used to have a bakery, we had a record shop, had a five and dime store, had an appliance store, furniture store, like 75% of that is gone, right? Um, and you, you, you throw in uh, the environmental injustices that we face that I highlight in my book because we, we don't have clean water a lot like Flint, Michigan, but a lot of poor rural towns because of the aged infrastructure of this country don't either. Uh, you talk about the educational disadvantages because children in this country are punished because of the zip code they're born into. And so you look at a place like Denmark that's right along the corridor of shame where kids go to school, their heating and air don't work, their infrastructure is falling apart. You talk about food deserts, which I'm sure you so, um, uh, you know, you're well versed in um, where you can't go two, three miles and have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, you talk about all of these things and then you overlay it with the pandemic and you're like, okay, well, why are black people dying at a, at, a, at, a, at a disparate rate? And you're like, this is why. This is why we have these comorbidities. You throw it all in perspective. And so I wanted to highlight those challenges um, of growing up in this area and shed light on these challenges. And, and, you know, one of the things that sometimes you and I both probably say is, you know, we try to be a voice for the voiceless. And one of the things that I learned while writing um, and just going deep in thought is that these people ain't voiceless. They just have been unheard. Right. Uh, they've been screaming for a long time. We just haven't listened. And so this was an opportunity to give them a, a give them an opportunity to let their voices be heard. Well, you know, the, the first point, and, and I want to encourage everybody who's following along, um, use the Q&A function here on Zoom. If you have questions, drop them in there, and I'll try to work them in as we're going. But the first point in the book where I was just like, wait a minute, me and this guy have to hang out a little bit, was when you were telling the story of your friend Pop. And, and I was just thinking about 
I was like, my, my pop is a guy named Craig, who's now a, he's a personal trainer in North Carolina these days. It's almost the same story. And, and I thought about how often just growing up, at, you know, as we say, young, black and gifted, you're, you're straddling these two worlds because you're constantly trying, because you carry expectations. And you talk about that some in the book as well. You carry expectations, but you also have social expectations among your peers. And, and you just see that on full display in your relationship uh, with, with your friend Pop. Let's talk about K through 12 education a little bit because you highlight that some in the book and in the combination of your experiences and his experiences. Walk me through, what, what was the difference maker there? So what I wanted to do was display the tension, I guess, that was there. Um, Pop was, is, not was, is my brother. If, if Pop is watching this, Tom, Tom special uh, with me and Dr. Cameron Webb, I, I want Pop to know that he's been a success, right? He, he went against the grain. Um, you know, he, his, he lost his, he lost his uh, father in a car accident. And I talk about that. Um, you know, he was one of many children. He came up on the other side of the tracks. He just kind of wandered into our house um, by virtue of my sister and stayed like Pop used to live with us. Um, you know, it's a, <laughs> the funny thing about black families, particularly in the South, is you can always probably find somebody who ain't related to them, who they've let in. You know, you don't have to have a whole lot to let other people into your home. Um, and Pop was, Pop was in our home and Pop was my brother and Pop was somebody who I love. Pop ended up with a felony. Um, Pop uh, ended up, you know, struggling through school, but he finished. Uh, he graduated. He got his GED. And then Pop actually graduated from uh, college. And then he was going to get his master's degree, but ended up with kids. And his mom was like, man, you gotta, you gotta raise these kids, right? You know, ain't no sheet of paper going to raise these kids. You got to. So, um, you know, I talked to Pop all, I talked to Pop yesterday, actually. He asked me, um, he, due to COVID, he got laid off. And so he's in line to get another job now. Uh, you know, he was looking for some help with some school supplies, of course. And he was like, you know, I'm gonna make y'all proud. I, you know, I always am kind of just that reaffirmation of who he is, but we're bonded by love and family. Um, and it's the tale of two stories. I tell everyone, man, and I think that you would appreciate this because people sometimes look at us as two black men with a couple of degrees, went to great schools, beautiful families as being atypical. And I'm like, Ain't not, we're not special. And I don't know if you, you I'm sure you know, you, you, you're not special. We were blessed and we had opportunity. And so our challenge in our political lives and our, you know, whatever we do personal or, or private is to create opportunities for those who are not as blessed and fortunate as, as we were coming up. And, you know, I've never met anybody that wanted a handout. I've never met anybody. And I, I know a lot of people who grew up kind of less fortunate um, don't nobody want nothing for free. They just want an opportunity, right? And um, Pop taught me a lot and humbled me and humbles me and protected me and still does protect me from myself more so than anything else. Um, and his troubles in the in the public education system are indicative of a lot of black men who get get lost. Yeah, and that's something that you you constantly talked about when you were describing being in the legislature. You, you, and this is something I've heard you say before, you know, that idea of the corridor of shame, that, that defines a lot of your political motivation. The idea to kind of redress some of those wrongs. Um, you talk about being a, a child of the movement uh, in so many ways, even though the spark for that happened before you were born. You know, you, you went through college, got a, a great education at, at the college I wanted to go to. And actually, we would I wanted to go to Morehouse 01 to 05. That's when I was you're, in college. You're, you're going to say they didn't give you no money. Is that, yeah. is that what happened? No, it's not that. It's that UVA gave me plenty. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's right down the road. And so we were just like, like my dad was like, don't be silly. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I think what's, what's yeah. interesting about it is you finish that up and immediately you said, I have, I have an obligation. I have work to do back home. Uh, and so when we talk about, you know, you, you talk about my vanishing country, we talk about cities rising. You wanted to be a real part of that, that, part of South Carolina rising. And, and tell me why you picked politics to be the vehicle for that. So my parents, just to back up a little bit, my parents all gave us, you know, these big bold choices. They said, you know, <laughs> weirdly, they said, you can go to any college in the country you want to go to as long as it's an HBCU. And then they said, uh, you know, you can do anything you want to do in the world as long as you're a change agent. So they would always give you these kind of parallels and, and kind of um, bumper rails is probably a better term. And so I always knew that that was what I wanted to do. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I actually went to Morehouse and was pre-med. Um, I took bio and chem for, for majors and then realized real quick uh, that that wasn't, that wasn't for me. Um, 
And so I, I went down this path of history and African-American studies, but uniquely enough, I had these uh, co-curricular experiences where I worked for the Atlanta mayor, Shirley Franklin. She used to be Shirley Clark from Howard University. She went to school with my dad. Um, I worked for Jim Clyburn in Washington, DC. And you know, when you taste politics, it's this bug you can't really get off of you. And I realized then, I mean, I, and this is gonna be a really weird exchange that, we will, that we're about to have, but I always tell people that um, politically, and I write about it, I say, I'd much rather be considered a, a Julian Bond than a Barack Obama. Now, you're also not gonna find a, a, a bigger fan of the 44th president than myself, but Julian Bond just fit the mold of uh, that type of uh, elected official I wanted to be, who was someone who was, um, he, not only immersed, but came from the cloth of the civil rights movement and toil in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia, someone who uh, um, understood what is quote unquote the establishment, but yet pushed the status quo to be that much more progressive, to be that much more accepting. You know, they didn't even, they didn't even uh, try to seat Julian Bond when he was a young up and coming uh, a former member of SNCC. And then I talk about that 1986 race between he and John Lewis. And so, um, you know, when I ran for office, I also remind people of this, that in 2006, most black, I actually announced, um, I, weirdly enough, I, I announced 15 years ago, September 18th, which, cause it's my birthday. I remember that. So, uh, 2005 is when I announced my 21st birthday, I was running, running for, for office. But at that time, a lot of young black folk were looking up to the governor of Massachusetts, uh, Deval Patrick, because he had reached that pinnacle of success. Barack Obama gave a great speech, but he wasn't, he wasn't that epitome of success that we all look to. Like people would go out and say, man, I want to be like Deval Patrick when I grow up. Like that was the thing. Right. Um, and so I just wanted to go back home and change. And I, you know, the, you, you remind me uh, of that um, um, kind of slogan that, that I gave great value to, which is that I wanted to go back and give to the people who had given me so much. Um, and that's why I ran for office. And that's why I ran for office at home. It was that and a heavy dose of insanity. I'm um, thinking at 21 years old, you could change the world, but I tried. You, you, you have to have that heavy dose of insanity. You, you literally came out of college and took on a long term incumbent <laughs> and, uh, and, and were successful because you had a real strategy behind it. Uh, you know, I want to I want to go back to what you just said, though. You, you mentioned Julian Bond and differentiated that. I wanna dig a little bit deeper on that because when we talk about, about political leadership, um, you know, and you talk about that election against uh, John Lewis, actually my, my college roommate's dad was, his, was John Lewis's campaign manager in that race. <laughs> so, I, don't even, uh, I don't even wanna talk about that campaign. You yeah, put me in a it, bad mood, but. It, 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 it describes a really important notion in right. uh, black politics. And I think that it's that notion that, you know, how, how activist are you? You know, how much are you going to, right you know, be in this space to push. So in your time in the legislature, um, do you feel like you were, you were more Julian Bond or do you feel like you were more John Lewis, so to speak? Oh, so, I, you know, that Congressman Lewis, John Lewis, his career was so long from 86 until we just lost him yeah. recently where he actually was able to have some, some uh, you know, many, many legislative successes, right? I mean, not, not some, but many. Um, he was able to accomplish a great deal, befriend many, many presidents. I mean, his career was so long. Um, in my time in the legislature, it was probably more like, like Julian because I was young, I was black, I was a Democrat, and I was a young black Democrat, right? So, um, you know, I had all of these things in the South Carolina General Assembly, where in 20, 2006, we were four, six votes difference. And after the Obama administration throughout that time, we went from being down four to six seats to being down to a supermajority. They didn't even need us to do nothing. Like they didn't need they were they didn't need us to do anything. My job was literally the definition of insanity. Every day I went to work expecting things to change and doing the same thing over and over again. Um, but you know, I just I have so much respect and admiration for both of them. Um, that race was very unique, and I do think that if 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 it was a and I write this, if it, if a clean race, if John Lewis would have run a clean race, then Julian Bond would have been the congressman from the fifth district. But like we can't throw shade at, at, at him at this point. It's, it's, it's not shade. It's not shade at all. It was I mean, it, that race is fascinating, man. It it's truly it truly was fascinating, and um, my dad actually is is very close to both. Was very close to both. My dad um, was the National Field Secretary and Program Director for um, 
SNCC. Um, he served uh, under both John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael. So we had a, a great, a great, uh, a great variety. And I grew up with all of these men who are my heroes. And Your son's name is Stokely. I mean, it's, it, it's impressive that- I'll say that loud because he will pop up. <laughs> pop up. But yeah, my son's name is Stokely at the Stokely <laughs> Carmichael, certainly. Yeah. So, and, and the one thing that you also noted, and I'm going to pivot off of politics in a second, but I like how you kept referring to your friend, Nikki Haley. You, you talk about your relationship with Mick Mulvaney and some of the other, you know, very much so Republican members of the legislature, even with that goal of, as you say, you went in there to, to change the world. You went in there to change South Carolina, but you made friends uh, and you made, you built relationships. Talk about how important that is to do the kind of work that we're talking about it and transforming these spaces. Yeah, one of the things that I think has made me just a better um, public servant and someone who understands the political process is not just having some level of experience, which is weird to say, like I retired from the General Assembly when I was 30 to run for statewide office, but I had served like nearly a decade, right? So that's a, you know, I was able to do a lot and meet a lot of people and accomplish some things. But South Carolina is, I was looking at a picture earlier today of Joe Wilson and Lee Atwater, right? Um, you know, the author of The Southern Strategy, someone who was, um, you know, as dirty a, a, a political trickster as they, as they come. Um, and I was just thinking about all the people I served with, not just Jeff Duncan, who's now a member of Congress. He was chair of our ad committee, but as you said, Tim Scott. Um, Tim Scott was a younger member of, of the General Assembly when I got elected. He didn't get elected till 2010. I got elected in, in 06. Um, uh, Nikki Haley sat beside me. Um, she's a friend. Uh, Mick Mulvaney was president of my legislative freshman class, um, who ended up becoming chief of staff uh, to uh, the president and is now special envoy to Ireland. Um, so just having an, an Andre Bauer, um, who is now a nominee for the ambassadorship to Belize, and Mark Sanford, who was governor, ended up serving in Congress. So just having all of these individuals who literally, I can call any time, Nikki's a little bit mad at me right now, but I can call at any time to, uh, and we, you know, we, we always talk about family. We always, you know, they, you know, they wish me happy birthday. Even Nikki sends me a text to say happy birthday. It was these relationships. And one of the things that I learned about, and one of the things that we learn about, about being in politics in the South is that the number one currency you can have um, our relationships. The tragedy is that 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 just harkens back to a day which I fear has passed, where we only retreat to silos and reinforce beliefs that we already have, where we only talk to people who have our same views and beliefs, and we don't go out and, and meet new people and have conversations anymore, a lot due to the 24-hour news cycle, a lot due to social media, but we're just not having these conversations which are healthy any longer. Uh, we're just retreating to our silos. Right. Right. Well, so, so I want to get a little bit more into the, the white water, as we call it, where things get a little rocky. I mean, one thing that the part of your book, and I'll be honest, um, you know, as, as things were moving on, I didn't expect to get into the conversation of Dylan Roof and what happened at, at that church. We, we're still in that conversation. I mean, that, that conversation has been uh, such a big part of, of our, our cities. And I think we, this whole Cities Rising Summit, so much of the focus has to be on finding justice and making sure that we're pressing toward justice in all these spaces. Uh, even in the book, you acknowledge uh, my good friend and former Vice Mayor of Charlottesville, Wes Bellamy, and, and some of the folks who are, who are doing work to try to, to press this forward. But I, you know, I guess the question I have for you, I mean, you articulate so thoughtfully through your book, just the, the challenges that we're facing and the need to have really authentic very real conversations to, to get to that next version of, of America. We talk about race in America. You know, what, what's your assessment of, of kind of where we are? You can't say it writ large, but, but where we are in the current moment and, and some of the factors that are driving the, the state of race in America. You know, people ask that question often. And, you know, there, there, there are a couple of larger kind of things that I, I like to throw out first. One is you have to define racism, right? And I use Stokely's quote that, um, if you want to lynch me, that's your problem. If you have the power to lynch me, then that's my problem. Understanding that race, racism is a, um, is a, is a power construct. Um, you know, I also talk to people about the fact that racism um, is based upon legality, right? Um, there's never been a law in this country that's discriminated against white folk. That doesn't happen. Um, but we have seen 
a, a whole system and create it even from those, you know, redlining areas through the black codes. I mean, we don't, uh, we can, we can all uh, come up with these laws that were uh, put in place to prevent the advancement socially, economically, um, politically um, for people of color. But we're at a unique point now where we appear to be having a conversation. Um, and people ask me, is it different now? And I'm always using the age old political adage, which you got to use with as many Republican friends as I do, you got to use this adage, which is trust, but verify. Um, and so I take it one day at a time in, in kind of having these discussions. And I'm also very cognizant to, to, to tell people that um, the issue of racism in this country is not for black people to figure out. Um, you know, there have to be conversations that are had by others. Um, about this issue and my, um, this pervasive issue. And my kind of experience is one that reminds folk that this isn't, this doesn't hearken from days past. Um, Emmett Till um, uh, at his most recent birthday would have been younger than Joe Biden, right? So this isn't like something that we just have to read about in our history books. Um, and so I'm very cognizant about this issue of race, understand that it's very nuanced, understand that it lacks partisanship. It's just an American conversation that we have to have. Yeah, and, and we're, we're certainly nowhere, nowhere near post-racial, nor should we be. I mean, I think the, the truth of the matter is race is, it's, it's a social construct. We know that it's something that, that is a part of so many conversations that you say at one point that it doesn't portend any, anything, any difference other than hair color or eye color, but yet still, it is such a different. Yeah, I, I read that. I go back and I, I struggled when I wrote that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was going to say. <laughs> uh, I really did. You know, there, there were certain parts of the book that I struggled with. But at the end of the day, I, one of the things I always landed on when you for when you write your memoir, Dr. Webb, one of the things I always landed on was just just landing on the side of truthfulness and honesty. And I struggled writing that there was a lot of tension. In my, in my head as I was jotting that part down about like, why do, why do people hate us? Like, what is it? I mean, is it, it, and it just boils down. It's just, I mean, it's the color of one's skin. And, you know, you tie that into Clemente Pinckney, who was my good friend who was shot um, in Charleston, South Carolina. And, um, you know, along with eight others, the grace that Clem showed to Dylan Roof. He was a straggly white kid with a backpack that he ain't never seen before who came into his church on Wednesday night where we know all black folk in the South are, right? Bible study. Mm -hmm. And Clem didn't sit him on the other side of the church or treat him like a stranger. Clem sat him right by him. And they, they, they taught and prayed and worshiped with this guy. And at the end of an hour, they bent, bowed their heads to pray. Dylan um, pulled out a, a, a nine millimeter and shot shot nine, shot Clem in the neck, stood over Polly Shepard and told her that he was gonna let her live so someone could tell the story. Um, you know, I talk about the pain that was associated with that night for me um, in particular, because I wanted people to be able to read. And this is, this is, this is where as an author or a writer, sometimes you may miss, but you, you, you try damn hard. I wanted people to be able to feel my pain um, in the words. And I wanted them to not only be able to feel that, but then draw that correlation back um, to my father, who is um, 40 years older than I, and understand that the biggest problem we have in this country is that he and I have too many sh of the same shared experiences from, you know, Jacob Blake and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, all the way back to Emmett and Jimmy Lee Jackson and Henry Smith and Samuel Hammond and Delano Middleton, from the 16th Street Baptist Church to Mother Emanuel AME. And all I tried to do was kind of in 240 some odd pages, just tie all of that pain into that sense of grief of that black experience, give people a sense of understanding, but even with that pain, give them a sense of hope as well. Well, something you just said, just, just hit me right in my core. You said, you know, you were struggling with that idea of why did they hate us? And, um, and my daughter asked me that question last year. She's a fourth grader now, but she was trying to figure out, you know, as they were getting into discussions of Black History Month, she's trying to figure out wait, wait, walk me through this because it doesn't make sense. And, sure. and it's, it's such an, as a parent, it is the most just impossible conversation to help a young child understand <laughs> why race-based hatred, racism exists. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just, I think um, 
Yeah, you know, I still haven't found a good answer, but I, I just. No, I mean, that's part of parenting. We really ain't got no answers, man. We just try to get them to the next day and leave by example. That's about all I got. But, you know, I, I was thinking about this and I'm, I'm writing my next book. Nah, I'm going to give myself a little break out this children's book and begin writing the next book, which comes out, another adult book. And I just, I know it's going to start at George Floyd and I know it's going to start with one of my, um, as a father, you know, I have a 15 year old who's upstairs somewhere doing something. Virtual school ain't, ain't it. But, um, you know, she went out and dressed in all black, put her mask on, went to protest and she had on this Black Lives, she had this Black Lives Matter sign, she and her girlfriends. And I tell people all the time, man, it was such a, you know, it was such a conflicting moment because I was so proud that, um, you know, my daughter would just we come from a family of activists. She's out there, you know, giving her all right. But then I was just so disappointed that she had to go out. Yeah. My daughter, I like I didn't do enough to protect her from having to go out and reaffirm her being or the fact that her life mattered. So I, I, I say this and I'm writing it. So when you guys read the first chapter of my next book, you'll already you will already know. But I'm like, I just want my daughter to be, be able to be like Baron Trump, which is just to be able to be 15 years old yeah. and comfortable in that. But my daughter has to instead say that her life matters. And that's that's a failure on us all. And that's a failure that I fear. And that's a failure that doesn't feel good. Well, and the fact that, that you know, and, and I heard this throughout the book, you carry that. You recognize oh, that yeah. responsibility as a generation. And, and I, that, again, there were so many parts where I was just like, I know exactly what, when you say that weight of expectation and responsibility. For me, you know, I can have whatever professional degrees I want, but at the end of the day, did I move us? Did I help us get right. to, you know, that that step that our generation is responsible? Everybody has to carry carry their load if we're gonna get get somewhere. You talked about we're not at the mountaintop, <laughs> you know. No, we're not. You know, we got to, and you're gonna have to remind folk people <laughs> too, because they say, you know, we did have that other tall skinny guy with a funny name, Bakari, who was president. So we made it, and I'm like, ah, 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 not quite. And so, you know, it, I that was the most important chapter I wrote, which was on anxiety and mental health. Mm -hmm. I called it a black man superpower because I wanted people to know that. And I, let me also give you this word of advice. You might not remember anything else, but remember this, Cameron, that when you write a book, make sure that your drop date ain't during the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> I, did, I, didn't. I thought about that. I was like, <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, I was out here like, man, this this pandemic is going to be over by the time this book come out. I didn't think we would still be sitting here today. I, I tell everyone I'm the only person uh, who did a full book tour with no pants on. I just sat over here in front of the computer uh, traveling the world on, on Zoom. Um, but yeah, man, that, that chapter on anxiety was powerful. Uh, yeah, it was, it was something I deal with. There's something that, I, you know, black men in particular think that the only people we can talk to are, are our barbers. And I wanted people to know that we can have some real deep conversations about who we are and the pressures we face and the fears we have. Well, and, and I still talk to my barber too, so shouts out. I mean, out. I do too, but oh, yeah. you know, I mean, not, not recently, but. But you, you know, I think from, from my perspective, I, I'm really quick to share, and the reason I love that chapter is I'm quick to share that, you know, I, I talk to my therapist every other Thursday and people are just like, whoa, you, you just let that roll off like it's yeah. normal. And I was like, because it is, <laughs> it should be. You know, we all need that investment. And, and I think we all, you know, when you deal with the kind of the multi-layered trauma that is being being Black in America, and I think that that's what, what people don't always understand. I don't know about you, but I'm bracing myself for this week because of Louisville. And, I, and I've already, I, I was sleepless last night because I was just like, I know something's coming. I know we're going to have to, address it, confront it, deal with that pain and that anguish. And every single time, it's the same experience. Folks are just like, so how do you feel about this? And you're just yeah. like, just need a minute, actually. So. I, I, I am, I am, uh, people are tired, man. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just, I always say being black in America is being in a perpetual state of grieving. And this year has borne me out to be true. I mean, you go from you go from George, Ahmad, Brianna, David McAtee, Jacob Blake, um, you go COVID. from, and I, I was, you know, I was going to get there to COVID. Um, Garland Gilchrist is one of my friends, dope dude, Lieutenant governor from the great state of Michigan. He, he, uh, he was talking about the fact that he lost 21, you know, either family members or close friends from COVID. Um, you know, it's just, it's just insane. And so people are tired and people are just trying to make it to the next day. You're losing your small businesses. You, you're, you're anxious. And, um, I just wanted to write something to help people make it through and I didn't think that I would be writing something to be 
to, to, to help people make it through during a moment when we needed the most help. And so I always say God doesn't make mistakes. He works in mysterious ways and just thankful for that. Well, you know, and I don't, I don't know that you necessarily, your goal was to end on a hopeful tone. Um, but I think that, but there's even through the, the challenge, through the pain, through the anguish, uh, and I want to get to the, the healthcare component because man, that was a powerful chapter. Um, but I, I think that even through all of that, um, you know, there is hope. There's hope that that there are going to be folks who say this is our this is ours to carry. This is our work to do, and we have to make sure that we we don't half step. Um, so so when you think about what gives you hope right now in in some of these communities, you know, whether it's communities like Denmark, South Carolina, or you know, cities all across America, what what gives you hope? Oh, you do. I mean, that's simple. That's an easy answer. I mean, you know, I am not done. Um, in my political career by any stretch, but right now is not my moment, all right? Uh, you know, I am, I'm so happy for people like you and, and Pam Keith, right, yeah. down in Florida. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm thrilled about Raphael Warnock. I'm thrilled about Jamie Harris. And um, there's just so many people who um, just give me hope because um, one of the things that the black folk have in this country is when we got here 401 years ago, we were stripped of everything, but our sense of hope and our sense of faith. And we've maintained those things throughout. Um, and so um, I will never let anyone take that away from me. But what gives me hope now is the fact that there's so many young people of like minds and good hearts. Like my politics ain't Jamal Bowman's politics. They're not, my politics aren't even Charles Booker's politics. Our politics are probably more in line with your politics, but we still have a very, um, you know, we, our hearts are still pointed in the right direction. And at the end of the day, we still recognize that we stand on the shoulders of people like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker, that we stand on John Lewis and Julian Bond's shoulders. And we recognize our awesome responsibility that we have to make them proud. So very simply at the end of the day, um, uh, somebody somewhere can look at, at, at Dr. Cameron Webb on November 4th, the day after this election, and win or lose, say, job well done. And so that's that's all we can ask. You know, I kept, well, thank you for that. I kept drawing, I kept drawing this line between Hiram Revels and you as I was reading this book and thinking about, about kind of South Carolina and everything it's been through, especially when you gave that, that passage about, uh, it was, in your dad's uh, textbook. My dad's textbook. Yeah, people are, that, that actually, between Pop and that, uh, that, you know, I, I, for those who haven't read the book, I actually found a, a chapter in my dad's textbook that, that they were taught. And so it, it's, it's pretty fascinating to, to read. Yeah. That was, that was one of the fascinating, but also like, you know, there are some paragraphs you read to get your blood pressure up. And we talk about, you know, I'm gonna get real doctory on you, allostatic load, the weight of chronic stress and the things that just will, will trigger you and cause your body to, to have this milieu of responses that increase your blood pressure, your heart rate, all these things. And I'm reading it and I was just like, you know, that text is the substance of so much pain, generational pain and anguish, you know? And, and that's, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that I think we're always contending with. But again, you know, when I read that, I thought of Hiram Rebels and I was just like, no, no, no. I think of that stately image of him and those other, I think it's six other folks sitting around him. And it's just like, that's a moment of, that's a bright moment. You know, during let me, let me read it real quick because people can think we crazy, but, yeah. but this is an excerpt from my father's middle school book about South Carolina history. It's a real life excerpt. excerpt. Uh, the book read, there were more Negroes than whites in the state. The Negroes were uneducated. They had no knowledge of government. They did not know how to make a living without the supervision of the white man. They were so accustomed to being taken care of that they had no idea how to behave under freedom. They stole cattle and chicken and hogs, burned barns and stables. They were not willing to work. They were like children playing hooky the moment the teacher's back was turned. There were so many more Negroes than whites that they would have been in control if they had been allowed to vote. They nearly ruined the state during the years they voted. The whites were determined this should not happen again. Regulations were made to prevent Negroes from voting. To this day, South Carolina is a white man's government. And it's like, it's echoes of birth of a nation. It's echoes of, of just this, this imagery that depicts what would happen 
And, and I think it's the reason why, you know, I'm, I'm in a congressional race and such a focus is on voter registration. And I'm thinking about what all I'm pushing up against. You know, the reason why we have 38,000 unregistered black voters in my district, it's not apathy. You know, it's, it's because of, of structures and systems and, right. and a deliberate attempt to separate black people from, from the vote. And I think it's a, you know, again, you got my blood pressure up again, man. Now I need to <laughs> go for a jog. <laughs> um, I, I, want, I want to spend, we've got about 13 minutes left. I, I want to bring things back around. You talk about healthcare, that's near and dear to my heart. But I love the lens because you started off by talking about um, black women. We, we, we used to describe the superwoman syndrome where black women carry literally the weight of America on their shoulders. Uh, and, and I think that along those lines, um, you talk about maternal mortality. I didn't know where, where this was going uh, when you started, but, um, but walk me through as a black man why you chose to really um, show that, that uh, emphasis on the burdens and the struggles that black women face in our healthcare system. Well, I mean, uh, to highlight your original point, I wanted to, you know, this, this chapter was my love letter to black women um, as always being the backbone of our communities. It was a love letter to my Aunt Jenny Marie, who was the matriarch of our family. She used to cook the sweet potato and coconut pies with two sticks of butter. That was so good. Uh, unhealthy as all hell, but they were so okay. good. Um, she drove till she was like 92, 93. I remember the day my dad had to go over and had that talk with her to get her keys because she was bumping into everything. She wore the big hats um, when she came to church. She sat on the second row and when you hugged her, you smell like Chanel number five for the rest of the day, right? Um, and so uh, I wanted to be a love letter to my wife and just talking about the strength. And when people look at me and you know, a lot of times they're like, so what's your, tell me what, what drives you? What's your number one political issue? And I'm like, African-American female mortality. Um, we had a, a harrowing experience in my, in my family. We had an amazing pregnancy. We had an awful birth. Um, you know, my wife, uh, when we were with our lactation specialist that evening, um, after Sadie and Stokely were born at 528, 533, um, at about 1030, my wife was, she was really hot. She threw up, she passed out. We pulled the the sheets back she had lost seven units of blood um uh you know the nurses were moving so slow i remember just furious like just trying to get somebody to care they were moving so slow so finally i just facetimed her doctor i mean they were three black women i knew them we're all part of the same social circle i was like man something wrong with my wife and they were like what's wrong i was like man look at this they were like we'll be there in a minute one doctor um black woman had an eight-year-old child it was like 10 30 11 o'clock at night she left um, her garage door open for one of her neighbors to come over and watch her kids. She got in the car, came back. They did an ultrasound on my wife's stomach, saw she was internally bleeding and hemorrhaging. They gave her, they took her to the, um, they did an emergency surgery on her. Um, uh, she was in ICU for the first 36 hours of the twin's life. They gave her a Bakri balloon. Uh, that's the extent of my medical knowledge. And it's weirdly spelled B-A-K-R-I, like one letter off from my name. How weird is that? Um, and just that strength that she had to, you know, that the persevere to live, you know, um, it was a very harrowing rough because here, here I am, they, they seal off, they bring in like a crash cart because your wife is dying. They sell off the entire floor. Nobody's allowed upstairs. My family's downstairs for the people who came to, to you know, hug the kids and her parents. Um, and they give me these two little bottles like little formula bottles and I got these twins up here and then I start saying the college prayer and I don't know if y'all said this at UVA I assume you did but like on Saturday morning after you drank a little too much on Friday night you would always say dear lord if you get me through this I promise you I'll never do x y and z right. <laughs> and so that's I, I said my college prayer um taught my brother and my 15 year old who was 13 at the time and um you know it was just a but it was, it's uniquely an experience that so many black women go through. Black women are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than their white counterparts. And it's one of the only doctor, it's one of the only true medical issues that crosses all socioeconomic barriers. Right. And so whether or not you're Serena Williams or Ellen Sellers, um, or whether or not you're on Medicaid, um, there is still a really high propensity that you can die during childbirth. And so I wanted to um, write that experience. We had some, we had a really long year last year with, that I write about near the end with Sadie having a liver transplant and having to go through all of those things. But, um, you know, we survived only to come into COVID. 
So I'm not counting the last two years of my life. Uh, I am still 34 yeah. and I'm waiting to be able to go back and visit Vegas when I want to and, and, and the cove in Atlantis. And no, this has just been, it's been tough, man. And it's, it's hard. Many, many, we talk about that anxiety. It gets hard, but um, in the, in, I think it's a, a Donnell Jones or Carl, Donnell Jones. I don't want to bore us. Uh, Carl Thomas. I don't want to bore you. And so I, I just, um, you know, I just attempt to, to smile and be a good father, be a good husband and go straight forward and do the best I can every single day. Well, I have to give you the, the roses on this one. Two things. One, um, when you just said that, I was like, that was your advice to, to Usher right there. You thanked God. And you, you <laughs> thanked God. God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but two, you know, as a physician reading that chapter, you, you nailed it. And so for anybody who hasn't read the book yet, um, you know, you still have some gems to get out of that, that chapter and the entire book, actually, it just, I think the, the arc of it was just perfect. And I think the way that you told that story had the kind of, it, it had um, the anxiety. It was as tense as those moments are in a healthcare setting. I think you captured it so well. And then acknowledging, you talked about just now having three black women who were your physicians and you talked about how that, that might have saved you, uh, did save your wife. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so so powerful. So what I, what I want to do um, as we come to a close, um, you know, you you talked a lot about about kind of your story. You talked about Denmark. You talked about other places and spaces where you've been. And when we talk about a path to just cities, um, you know, we if we're looking at this November. Of course, we've got political elections. Of course, we have a lot of dynamics and conversations to have. What do you think are the most important steps that we need to be taking as communities? You know, in, in in total, not just as the black individuals in these communities, but as communities to be moving toward just cities. Yeah, in order to have your city rise, the first thing you need to do ain't, I mean, November 3rd is important, but the most important thing, and people usually tap me on this and say, I can't believe you said it, but it's true, is uh, fill out the census. And census is, is arguably, not even arguably, is the most important thing. I know saying that to a candidate who's running for office ain't necessarily the survive, but uh, <laughs> it really is the most important thing if you're talking about how we develop and divvy uh, resources and power for the next decade. Um, the second thing is make a plan to vote, man. Um, you know, I am, Donald Trump has taught me that the will of government for good or evil can sometimes have a prowess that's unimaginable. For example, did you know that the government can come and pick up mailboxes when they want to? I had no idea that was a thing. Right. I did not know that the government could just be sitting there like, man, I'm about to go get all these mailboxes. We don't even want the mail delivered for three days. Like, I didn't know that was possible. Um, so it's teaching me um, that the, the will of the government. Um, with that being said, uh, I'm making a plan. I'm wearing, wearing a mask and going to vote early. Mm -hmm. I'm not trusting putting my ballot in, in a mailbox. And so I would encourage all of you all to vote early. I know you I know early voting's already started in Virginia. Um, go ahead and exercise that right. Wear a mask, take a lawn chair, stand six feet apart um, and get it done. And so um, with that and fill out the census are the two ways that we can take control of our destiny. There are 4 million people who voted in 2012 for Barack Obama, 4.4 to be exact, um, who did not vote for Hillary Clinton in 2016. Of those 4.4 million, over one third were um, people of color and um, you know, our vote has power. I expect to see record high turnouts and um, we'll see what happens. I think we control our own destiny at the ballot box. Well, I, I think that's, that's great wisdom, insight and advice in terms of what communities need to be doing. And again, I always say that stuff is, it's necessary, but not sufficient. The conversations that go along with it, I, I think that you speak to throughout the book are really important. So, um, so for those of you who haven't had a chance yet, you know, definitely do, you know, check out this, this memoir. You know, it's funny, I'm like 36 year olds memoir, uh, but, but it's packed, it's powerful. There's so much in there. So thank you so much for sharing your story, for your, sharing your experience, for sharing your time with us this evening or this afternoon. Um, I'm actually heading into work in the hospital tonight. So I'm just like, yeah, it's my day's over. It's, it's a wrap for me. I'll be, I'll be in the COVID unit from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. But, uh, but anyway. Come home, make sure you come home and take your clothes off in the garage and go shower, okay? Yeah. 
that don't bring, uh, don't bring that stuff back in the house. Lean and Webb is not playing around with that, but 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 I do want to I, I want to close by saying thank you to everybody who who joined us. I want to pass it over to Chelsea Woodfolk, who's gonna who's gonna uh, you know bring us home. But thanks again, uh, Bakari, for joining us, and I'll pass it over to Chelsea. Thank you so much, my brother. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Mr. Sellers and Dr. Webb, for an incredible conversation. Um, on behalf of the team at Cities Rising, I would like to thank you for sharing your um, insights and expertise. Also, thank you to everyone who attended today for being a part of this. If you enjoyed the session, please consider becoming a contributing member to the foundation. Um, you can do so on our website, tomtomfoundation.org give. We hope that you will join us at other events throughout the Cities Rising Summit. This entire week will focus on criminal justice reform. Tomorrow, we will host a talk with Alec Kar Karat Kasanis, a groundbreaking attorney rolling back money, bail across the South, and a panel discussion with three local prosecutors pursuing progressive policy in different regions of Virginia. We are now hosting a short meet and greet for anyone who is interested in attending. The link is in the chat. Um, we are calling it a wind down, so feel free to bring your favorite beverage and click the link in the chat to join. Finally, we would like to thank our sponsors. Without their support, none of this would be possible. Today's session was brought to you by Seville, by Seville Weekly and Good Stock Consulting. Thanks again. We'll see you all soon. Bye. The day of reckoning is finally here. No justice, no peace for too many years. Marching for equality in every state, choosing love over violence, brutality, and hate. We're gonna stand.